took the, the tour of the Special Commitment Center, I was very, very careful to avoid improper ex-party contact. I wrote the superintendent a letter before I went out there saying that please advise the prisoners that I don't want to hear about their individualized cases. I repeated that again when I was out there. And you know what? None of the prisoners talked to me about their individualized cases. They had other things to say, you know, the food is lousy, or we're not getting anything out of the program or whatever, uh, what, what you'd expect to hear. When judges take tours of uh, prisons or hospitals or schools, they talk to the people that are there. I talked to the staff, some of the prisoners had something to say, and I listened to what they had to say. The, there was a complaint filed against me by a couple of prosecutors saying that I had had improper ex parte contact. But you know what? At the end of the day, after a three-day hearing, or maybe it was a five-day hearing, all 11 members of the commission found that I did not have ex party, improper ex parte contact. They did unanimously dismissed those charges, but nevertheless, the majority, seven to four, Justice Schulteis, wrote the dissent, said that I engaged in the appearance of impropriety. So now, if, if I comply with the rule regarding ex parte contact, uh, what is there to hang your hat on about appearance of impropriety? It's, it's confounding to me. Uh, currently, there's a task force uh, that, that has recommended a revision, whole-scale revision, to the Code of Judicial Conduct, which would eliminate the appearance of impropriety language. So, Charlie, I'm very much in favor of, of eliminating that language because I don't know what it means. And uh, I, I also disagree with you about uh, quoting papers, newspapers. Uh, you, you know, candidates go around and they, and Charlie does this and I do this, we go, we go around and we solicit uh, articles of, about our candidacy. So I think the candidate should take some responsibility for what they tell the newspaper. Surely the newspaper doesn't always quote it correctly but, or st state it correctly, but I think the candidate should try to correct it if it doesn't come out right. And, uh, you know, the Yakima Herald would have done that. Charlie, Charlie didn't see fit to do that. But most of the stuff in this flyer is quoting from Charlie's own campaign materials. I, I believe that's the only one that I discussed that had to do with uh, a newspaper account. Well, can, can, I, I, can I? No, let, let him respond, and then we've got to go one question. We can't have one person done this. Okay, I, I want to thank you, Art, for your comment, because that is a misquote. Uh, the statement about the liberal slap on the wrist uh, policy. I, those were the reporter's words. I, I, no, I didn't go. I, I've got a lot to do. This is a busy campaign. And I didn't go back to the reporter and ask him to listen to the tape and, and confirm that. I didn't really, didn't really expect that to be a, an issue. And so I didn't pursue that. But let me talk about the appearance of impropriety and the, and the visit to McNeil Island. Because there's a published decision in that case, and it's a published decision affirming the admonition uh, for the visit. And there are a few facts that really should be mentioned here. This was not just a prison visit. Of course, prison visits are a good thing. I went on a prison visit when I was on the Court of Appeals, and I think it's a positive thing to do. This was a visit that was initiated by a, a, an invitation by inmates at McNeil Island who had cases pending before the Supreme Court and wanted the justices to come down. And one of the letters even said, you know, you might want to invite the prosecutors so there's not some appearance of impropriety. And I'm just telling what's in the opinion here. Um, well, two of the judges, three of the judges said, yeah, they, they thought they would go. And two of them quickly had second thoughts and didn't go. The only justice who went is Justice Sanders. And while he was there, indeed, according to the opinion, uh, he's ushered through the facility and, and questions are, you know, he meets various uh, folks and talks with various folks and it's in the opinion that he said, can't talk to you about the issues in your case. It's also in the opinion that, had a, that you had a discussion with several of the inmates about the issue of volitional control, which was an issue in a dissenting opinion that was in circulation at the time. So, uh, yes, the courts, uh, the, uh, the finding was that there was not an improper ex party communication. Perhaps you should have known that these people had uh, cases. Perhaps you didn't know. But that there was not only an appearance of impropriety, but there was another canon violated, and it was the failure to uphold the integrity and independence of the court. I think the appearance of impropriety is an important thing. And, I, and, and let me give you an example of that that occurred to me yesterday. 
I'm a hearing officer in the disciplinary system. I'm set for a hearing. I was set for a hearing next week on a, on a lawyer discipline case, a four-day hearing. Wednesday night, I got an email about the fact that the expert witness for the lawyer had discussed the disciplinary system for me six months with me six months ago at a social event and didn't know I was on the case. I didn't know she was on the case. I'm not even sure I was on the case at the time. And then the, there was a subsequent encounter and, you know, so the, they raised this issue. I didn't think I would be biased if I heard the case, but I did think it would raise an appearance of impropriety. I stepped back, I stepped down, I thought it was an appropriate thing to do. Okay, questions for Charlie. Bill. Uh, Charlie, could you discuss the issue of recusal when you, the justice has cases involving major contributors to this election campaign? Thank you, Bill. I'd be happy to do that. Um, I, I, I do have to correct one thing that Justice Sanders has pointed out here um, on the flyer that I've distributed. I talked about the Caperton case, Caperton versus Massey. And um, in my material, it says that um, the Caperton case, of West, uh, case that arose in West Virginia, uh, where the president of a company spent $3 million getting a judge elected to the West Virginia Supreme Court. The judge then sat on the case uh, over protest, and it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. I was asked to write an amicus brief in that case, and I, I did. I, I represented 27 former Supreme Court justices from 19 different states who said that's a violation of due process of law. Justice Sanders joined in an amicus brief from the other side saying it's fine. There's no due process of law because the money wasn't given directly to the judge's campaign. Only $1,000 was given to the judge's campaign. $500,000 were independent expenditures, two and a half million dollars was run through a pack, and so that that was okay to sit on that. I don't think that's, I think that the U.S. Supreme Court correctly decided that's a violation of due process. When my material says $3 million was donated to the judge's campaign, Justice Sanders has pointed out correctly, that's a slight misstatement. $3 million was spent on the justice's campaign to get the judge elected. Now, that kind of really uh, pointed up to me there's a problem with our judicial elections and it is these independent expenditures can result in someone spending massive amounts of money independent of the judge's campaign to get the judge elected. I think when that happens there's a threshold beyond which that judge should not be able to sit on a case but should recuse. I drafted a rule to accomplish that. The rule went through the whole process with the um, task force that Justice Sanders has alluded to um, uh, that uh, really was kind of making the recommendation to the Supreme Court and it's now before the Supreme Court uh, for approval or disapproval. I'm in favor of that recusal rule. I think Justice Sanders is opposed to it, but I, 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 you know, I'll be happy to have him speak for himself. I think it's important to reduce the influence of special interest money, large special interest money, in judicial elections and the recusal rule is a good way to do it. Well, I think it's sort of like whack-a-mole. Uh, uh, several years ago, uh, Charlie uh, was in favor of limiting campaign contributions to individual candidates uh, in judicial uh, elections. So was Governor Gregoire, and eventually that passed the legislature. But a year before, when it was first proposed, the year before it was passed, I wrote an op-ed and I said, well, you know, if you do that, you're going, to, uh, you're going to have to confront independent expenditures by organizations and groups that uh, want to get more involved than is permitted by a direct contribution to a campaign. And sure enough, uh, immediately after uh, that law went into effect, I think it was in June 2006, then there was a concerted effort by uh, both sides to uh, make independent expenditures uh, and uh, in the amount of uh, a couple of a million dollars. So, you know, what do you do? I, I think contributions directly to the campaign are better than independent expenditures because the candidate is tied to his own campaign. He's responsible for how that money is spent. And if it's spent irresponsibly or dishonestly or irrelevantly, like I think most of those independent expenditures were spent, then the candidate is going to have to take own up and take responsibility. So it's a uh, 
complicated uh, problem.